All right, well, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Keith St. Clair. I teach political science, uh, international relations, American government. And I had the opportunity to go to Iran uh, last fall. I, got, I was there for two weeks, and I got back October um, 10th. And uh, the Grand Rapids Community College Foundation was um, generous enough to help fund my trip. It was a professional development grant that I had applied for. And uh, what I learned over there uh, was both fascinating to me personally, but also things that I'll be able to uh, factor into my international relations and comparative government courses that I teach. So uh, I'm pleased to be here and able to talk to you about the experiences and the things that I learned while I was over there. Of course, this is a map of Iran. And uh, the cities that I actually had the opportunity to go to were Tehran, Kerman, uh, Yazd, which is over here, Shiraz, and Esfahan. So that's kind of the circuit that I was able to travel in over the course of those two weeks. And of course, uh, some of you um, may know Iran in the, in the ancient context where, um, you know, for a long time, Europeans have called it Persia. Uh, the people who live there have typically always called it Iran. But uh, this is the, if you will, the descendants of uh, the great Persian Empire that you've probably read about in your ancient history class, uh, the ones that fought the Greeks, the ones that um, Alexander the Great uh, conquered. And I had an opportunity to see um, quite a few of the ruins of that empire. Um, we're talking about the empire that Cyrus the Great founded, uh, Xerxes, Darius, the great Roman emperor, or excuse me, Persian emperors uh, of that time period. And a, a lot of the ruins are still there uh, in Persilop Persopolis, where we had an opportunity to go, which would have been uh, the ceremonial capital where the, the kings of this ancient Persian empire would have been crowned. And these are some of the uh, uh, artifacts that remain. This is a golden uh, rattan, which is a, uh, essentially a drinking vessel that the king or uh, royalty would have used. Another, another uh, vessel for holding liquids made out of gold. Um, I think this is actually uh, from the M M Medes Empire, which was um, replaced by the Persian Empire. This is the, uh, the Gate of Nations at Persopolis and would have been the entryway um, to that city. And so a lot of these ruins are still there and are actually... Um, they're fantastic to see, so um, you should, uh, I would encourage you to go. I mean, Iran is a very, um, very friendly to the United States, more so than I ever really imagined. And so there were a lot of tourist groups that were there, both from Europe and other tourist groups from the United States, which was kind of um, not what I anticipated when I got there. This is the area where the kings of ancient Persia are buried. Um, it reminded me a lot of the Valley of the Kings in ancient Egypt. And this is the tomb of Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, which is a little bit more modest in scale. Uh, but he would have been the founder of that empire. And so I wanted to show you these slides to show you that, you know, what a, a civilization that existed in this region that the Iranians had going all the way back uh, in the, uh, the B.C. period. And they're, you know, they're quite proud of it. And so um, this all factors into uh, Iranian nationalism as it exists today. The Iranians are quite proud people. Um, they're Indo-European in that uh, their language is much more similar to German and other European languages than, say, Arabic. Uh, the Persians will be the first ones to tell you that they're not Arabs. And they don't speak Arabic. And their language is not, um, not even related to that. Arabic is a semantic language. And um, um, Persian, as they call it, or they, they would use the term Farsi, we would call it Persian, but it is an Indo-European language, and so much more related to, um, like I said, German. This is a, um, the Azadi Tower in Tehran, and it was built by the last Shah uh, to, uh, for like the 2500th anniversary of the founding of the Persian Empire. And so the Shah, which is the Persian word for king, um, Iran was a monarchy up until 1979 where they had the Islamic Revolution. But even the last king of Iran was commemorating and drawing comparisons to the ancient Persian Empire um, that Alexander the Great 
uh, conquered. So there was this great affinity. And so um, today this is called the Freedom Tower, and it's disassociated with the last Shah. The Shah has now become, uh, since the revolution, a kind of a dirty word, but uh, they're beginning to get over um, the use of the term. Right after the revolution in 1979, all Shahs were kind of, uh, in Iran's past, were kind of um, uh, downplayed and uh, um, it, it, there was a there was attempts to forget uh, the importance of that. But nowadays they're they're becoming more comfortable, certainly with the ancient Persian Empire and rediscovering that past uh, for themselves and taking renewed pride in it. This now is also the uh, location of a lot of the protests that you may have seen on television. It's been a rallying point for protest, even in the 1979 revolution, but even today against the government. And uh, the protests, I was told, stretched from this tower, which is really on the edge of the city of Tehran. It was a city of about 12 million people. This is actually near the airport. And the, the lines in the, in, the, in the street protests stretched all the way back into the center of town, which is, which is a significant distance. And so it kind of gives you the impression that there, there really is a mass unrest uh, amongst the populace even today. This is the cityscape of Tehran, and you can see that uh, you know, it's fairly modern. Uh, the hills in the background um, overlook the city. The higher you go up in the elevation in the city, the more wealthier the neighborhoods. The, the poor people tend to live uh, in the lower elevations. But um, yeah, I, thought, I found a lot of the modern conveniences of, uh, of uh, you know, modern urban life, uh, the population of Iran is, is, the majority of it is urban. Certainly there are poorer regions in the, um, in the countryside and the rural areas. Uh, this shows you uh, the typical dress that the women had to wear. I found that Iran was far more secular than I anticipate, anticipated it to be. After the Iranian Revolution, uh, you know, a religious theocracy was put in place with religious law, enforcing Muslim law, otherwise known as Sharia law. And uh, those laws are in place, and the regime certainly is a theocracy. But uh, I was surprised amongst the average persons how, you know, how secular they actually, they actually were. Um, you know, for example, alcohol is uh, prohibited in Islam, and therefore it's against the law in Iran. But as I was uh, frequently told that if I wanted alcohol, I could easily get it. And just about anybody who wants, who, anybody who was drinking alcohol before the revolution can easily drink it now. They just do so in the privacy of their own homes uh, where they have private parties or they won't, they, obviously there's no bars that they would actually go to. We didn't really push the envelope of those laws. It's not something that we were going to um, uh, create. Uh, we weren't going to be the unwelcome guests. So we didn't drink any alcohol for, for two weeks. And even in the hotels, there was none available. The women in our group, and there was about maybe 25 of us, um, and about easily half were, half were women. And the women all had to wear the hijab, which is required under um, the, the law in Iran today, which is a, just simply a hair covering. They just have to have their hair covered. Um, and this is because hair is, uh, the female hair especially, is considered incredibly provocative, uh, apparently too sexy for the, the men of Iran to handle. So. Uh, the women have to cover up just out of out of decency, but this is not the way most women dressed prior to the Islamic Revolution in 1979 under the Shah. So this has been a um, uh, like a recent installation on the part of the theocratic government. But you got the sense that the Iranian women would prefer not to. Um, certainly, there were con some some conservative women who are more covered up than others. But many of the Iranian women, especially the younger ones, were definitely pushing the envelope on this rule of having the hair covered, where they were wearing the scarf high and back on, uh, on the head, showing as much hair as possible. Um, and if a, a government official might come around, they might be more self-conscious about it and bring it down. But they definitely, there was this subtle resistance, even out uh, everywhere I saw in the society. And it was probably most demonstrated for me when um, I was getting on the plane to leave to fly from Tehran to Germany. And I, I didn't pay as much attention when I arrived 
because when we arrived, everybody who got off the plane had to put their hijab on. They had a um, uh, security, revolutionary guards outside the plane making sure that all Westerners were dressed appropriately. But when we left, I, I paid attention and I looked on the plane and every Iranian woman on that plane took their hijab off as soon as they were on the plane. And so, to me, that's, that spoke volumes about what they thought about uh, would they choose to wear it if they had the choice. In, in the Iranian society, they don't have the choice. They have to wear it everywhere. Even the tourists that, uh, that were in our group could not take off their, the women could not take off their hijab even in the, um, the hotel room. Or they, in the hotel room, they could, but not in the hotel. It was the, the hotel room, when they were in the privacy of their own hotel room, that was the only time that they could actually take their hijab off. And uh, the American women in our group knew that was going to be the case when they agreed to travel. But knowing it's going to happen and uh, actually doing it are really two different things. They really grew to hate uh, wearing that hijab, the women in our group. Uh, but it was, and we felt sorry for them, uh, the men in the group, but there was, you know, that was the requirement. We, we weren't going to be able to, to break the law. It, the, the initial offense would be a fine, and then if it, it, uh, a, sec, a second offense could result in a, in a jail sentence. You also notice that the, the women are not uh, typically wearing what some Arabs would wear, which is the burqa, where it's a full-length covering like you might see in Saudi Arabia. Uh, all the law requires is that the hair be covered. And so they don't have to wear the veil. They don't have to wear a full-length burqa. We did see a few women wearing a, a Persian cape, which is known as a chador, where it just basically wraps around and covers up everything except the face. But, uh, and obviously those women would have been much more conservative and traditional. But most of the women were dressed like this. And, and I must say that a lot of the women really, you know, made the scarf uh, in, in as, as much as a fashion statement as they, as they could make, while at the same time pushing the envelope as far as how much of the hair is actually revealed. This is the, the school children dressed in, in their uniform. Um, and so they tried to train the girls early to get used to wearing that hijab. I took this picture because it's a, it shows a, a woman's taxi. This, this is a specific taxi that was uh, in Tehran that was catered to women only, and it was driven by women uh, so that women would feel more comfortable. Uh, much of... Um, uh, things in Iran are segregated so that women have to uh, basically ride at the, at the back of the bus and, and men in the front. Unless they're a married couple, then they could ride together. This is the chador. This is the, the Persian cape that I was talking about and would be the most, uh, the most conservative dress. This is a, in the rural areas, this is a, a traditional door, and there's two knockers on the door. Uh, the one on the left is heavier than the one on the right, and so it make a, a louder thud when you knocked on it. And this is to tell the woman inside that there's either a man at the door or a woman at the door, so she can know how to come to the door to present herself. I also found that the women in Iran were much more assertive than um, I had experienced in many of the Arab countries that I traveled. In Egypt, for example, I can remember kind of being scolded for approaching a woman that I didn't know uh, and, and actually speaking to her. Um, you know, that's just something you didn't do. But in Iran, it was, it was far from that. In, in Iran, women would just come right up to you. I mean, they would just... Women I did not, they just come out and start asking me questions, start talking to me. I found this much more, um, women in that sense, far more liberated than I have in many of the Arab countries that I've visited. And, and more than just liberated, but actually very assertive. And I, and I was told that even by Iranian men, that, uh, uh, that, <laughs> that women are uh, more of the equals in the households. And, that the, uh, and even though the shir Sharia law allows, like in many Muslim countries, a man to have up to four wives... I asked, uh, and <laughs> none of the men I talked to knew anybody who had more than one wife uh, for fear of what their wife might do if they actually married another one. Uh, the man I talked to, was, who was our guide, 
he said that uh, if a man did have more than one wife, which he didn't know any, um, he would either have to be incredibly rich or uh, just weird. You know, it was just, it was just not typical, even though uh, under Muslim law and in Iran, it is allowed under the law. These women were actually uh, just uh, begging to have their picture taken. They just <laughs> they were just thrilled. Uh, and it, that was the other thing I was surprised about. Uh, as an American traveling in Iran, I kind of didn't know what to expect. I kind of thought that there might be uh, some hostility, given the facts that our, our two governments have had such problems in, in recent years. But on the contrary, I found that um, everyone that I talked to was just thrilled when I said I was an American and was visiting. They were absolutely thrilled that Americans would actually come uh, to their country. They were fascinated with American culture, um, you know, everything from our music. Uh, certainly they can get our clothes there, but um, the music, by and large, is banned. They're not allowed to play rock and roll on the, on the radio stations because um, it's deemed by the government to be subversive. But they do have Iranian rock bands that uh, record their music abroad, and then they smuggle the music and the CDs back into the country. This is a, a man who was in the bazaar. And this was a, a family. This, um, what I thought was interesting about this man's T-shirt is he's got U.S. Navy SEALs on his T-shirt. Again, so not something I would expect. So, uh, again, there's just this fascination with America and American, American culture, even though there's been, uh, their government doesn't get along with ours. In fact, they were very apologetic about their government and their president. President Ahmadinejad. Uh, I, more than one person told me that their president is an idiot, and that, uh, and I, 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 f I felt I knew what they were talking about, uh, <laughs> but I could relate to that. So, but they were they were absolutely um, sorry that their government had given uh, um, you know this hostile uh, impression against the United States. But they, the people generally, they loved uh, Americans. I, I was astounded by that. These are um, some conscripts in the Iranian army. So this is not the Revolutionary Guard. And the Revolutionary Guard would be uh, the elite uh, military units of the regime. And they probably would be very hostile to the United States. But these are just draftees. And every Iranian man has to serve in the Iranian military. So uh, these men would, uh, they would serve maybe for two years. And they were just thrilled to talk to Americans. So uh, a far cry from the reception we might have gotten if we were talking to the Revolutionary Guard. This actually uh, is a poster. Uh, we saw this a lot, commemorating the, 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 the loyalty and the heroism of the um, Iranian military. And remember that uh, it wasn't that long ago that Iran fought a horrendous war against Iraq. Uh, from 1980 to 1988, when Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. This was shortly after the Iranian Revolution, at a time that uh, Saddam Hussein thought that uh, Iraq, Iran was weak. He thought uh, this would be an opportunity for uh, him uh, to aggrieve uh, ancient rivalries between Persians and Arabs and actually take a more Iranian land. Well, it didn't work out that way, obviously. He didn't end up winning the war. It was more of a stalemate that only ended after eight horrendous years, and millions of people on both sides actually died. And the, the Iraqis, of course, and Saddam Hussein actually used uh, chemical weapons against the Iranians, which the Iranians did not, they did not reciprocate. Um, chemical weapons, according to the Ayatollahs in Iran, has, have been considered a, a, a sin. And so they, uh, they lost a lot of lives. And it was probably one thing that saved the Iraqi government from actually defeat, which is why at the time uh, President Reagan of the United States was willing to look the other way. And although we scolded them publicly, we didn't do a whole hell of a lot about the use of Iraq's weapons. It wasn't until, of course, um, we captured Saddam Hussein in the last invasion of 2003 of Iraq that we all of a sudden felt the need to bring him to justice for using chemical weapons back in the 1980s. But at the time, we were more concerned about Iraq winning the war against Iran than um, any human rights violations along those lines. And of course, Saddam Hussein not only used the weapons, the chemical weapons against Iran, he used them against the Kurds because the Kurds were rebelling in Iraq. They were actually assisting the Iranians. The Kurds are also not Arabs.
Saddam Hussein being an Arab. So he saw the Kurds as uh, basically allies of the Iranians, and so he treated them one and the same. So this war is remembered. I mean, there's not m uh, many Iranians who can't name a loved one who lost their lives in this war in the 1980s, which perhaps is uh, one of the reasons why, um, you know, the Iranians, the people anyway, were very thankful, even of George W. Bush, uh, for taking care of Saddam Hussein. Um, they hated Saddam Hussein. And for the United States to have taken out Saddam Hussein was a tremendous gift to the Iranian people. Uh, likewise, uh, ir the United States taking out the Taliban, um, another enemy of Iran, was um, also something that they were grateful for. Now, they're not exactly inclined uh, to want the Americans to remain. They would like the Americans to leave Iraq and Afghanistan because they see the, the Iranian government sees the United States as a potential threat as well. But they didn't have a problem with President Bush taking out their two fiercest enemies. Now, so where does all of this hostility against the United States come from then? Um, it really goes back to the last Shah. Um, you know, in the 1950s, it was 1953, um, Iran got an elected government, uh, a parliament, um, and the Shah was very much despised, and he actually fled the country for a year or so. And the prime minister at the time, Mossadegh, uh, attempted a, to enact a socialist policy, which was to nationalize uh, the American, or excuse me, the Anglo-Iranian oil company, which is today known as uh, BP, which is British Petroleum. And so the British were absolutely furious that the Iranian government in the 1950s would nationalize this oil company. And so they worked with the United States, who at the time was very concerned about worldwide communism, and they saw this move as very much reminiscent of socialism. So the U.S. government and the CIA conspired out of the U.S. Embassy in order to overthrow the elected government of Iran uh, and the Prime Minister Mossadegh. And they did. Uh, and the Shah, who was in exile, was invited back, and he regained control of the country. And so... You know, it's interesting that the United States seems so concerned that we spread democracy today and that Iran become a democracy, when in the 1950s there was an Iranian democracy, and we overthrew it, uh, bringing back a king and a monarchy for, for the uh, Iranian people. And, and the, sh the last Shah of Iran was not uh, uh, a benevolent... I mean, he was a dictator, and he wasn't a benevolent one. He was quite cruel. There was a secret police known as the Savak, and... Uh, it wasn't just uh, Muslim fundamentalists who, who despised him. It was, um, it was also uh, even liberals. So he was universally hated, which led to this mass revolution in 1979 when the Shah was overthrown. And when he was overthrown, he was exiled. And um, it was, uh, you know, so where did this resistance against the Shah come from? Well, the Muslim faith, or the, the faith of Islam, played an important role in that in that the one institution that the Shah did not f have total control over and did not, uh, did not have the nerve to attack directly was Islam, the religion. It's not really unlike what happened in Poland during the, the latter part of the Cold War. You know, where did the uh, resistance to po communism, the communist government of Poland during the Cold War, where did they take, uh, find sanctuary? They found it in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church played a role in protecting the critics of the regime because the, the, the communist government, as powerful as it was, did not dare take on the Catholic Church and the people's religion. In much the same way, it occurred that way in Iran with the Shah. That was the one area of uh, Iran, Iranian life that the Shah did not dare uh, take on completely. So the clerics, the Iranian clerics, played a, a role in providing sanctuary for a resistance movement. So when the revolution came, there was a lot of uh, gratefulness towards the faith of Islam for playing that role and to the clerics themselves. And one prominent cleric who lived abroad was one uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah, by the way, is a, is a, um, it's a title. Uh, it's uh, anyone who has like a, a doctorate degree in Muslim theology 
in Shiite Islam is known as an ayatollah, and they acquire this title. And they are the, the, the highest ranking figures in the, in the clerical establishment in Iran. And there are mo more than one ayatollah. There happens to be an ayatollah who is the uh, supreme leader of Iran today. He, have his, he even has more powerful. His name is Khomeini, not to be confused with Khomeini, uh, who's the guy I'm going to talk about next. But uh, there are more than just one ayatollah. It's a, it's a title. It's not a name. So the ayatollah Khomeini was living in exile in France. And when he saw the revolution occur in 1979, he came back from exile, and he was greeted with throngs of, uh, uh, of crowds because he had been one of the greatest critics of the Shah. And so he was kind of a hero of sorts. Uh, and when he returned, he was able to take advantage of, uh, uh, of the revolution and consolidate power. Now, so the revolution of 1979 occurs. The Shah's exiled. And what did I just say happened the, first, the, the, the last time that occurred, back in the 1950s? Uh, the Americans overthrew it, right. And they did it with what? The CIA. The CIA working outside of the, or out of the, Iran, or the, U, the U.S. Embassy in Iran. And so after the 1979 revolution, the first thing the Iranians are worried about is, are the Americans going to overthrow this revolution and bring back the Shah like they did in the 1950s? And so, of course, they were worried about the CIA, and they knew where the CIA had done it in the U.S. Embassy last time. So one of the first things that ends up happening with, by the end of the year is that uh, these Iranian college students end up seizing the American Embassy to, pr to preempt any similar attempt to bring back the Shah. Now, the Iranian government, who uh, is soon controlled by the new Ayatollah Khomeini, he plays very coy with that and says, you know, th this is not our government that's doing that. These are just some college students that are out of control. Now, obviously, seizing the American embassy is a, a huge violation of international law, and the United States was adamant that uh, the, our personnel, who are being held hostage, be released. And we assist, insisted that the Iranian government see to that. Well, the Iranian government, like I said, pretended that they were not involved, but they pretended to be uh, medi intermediaries on behalf of these college students who had taken these uh, Americans hostage. But really, the Iranian government under the Ayatollah Khomeini was behind it all along. And so they did it as a, as a, to prevent the Americans from subverting this new revolution and then the Ayatollah Khomeini capitalized on it to consolidate power to himself. And he ended up betraying a lot of the liberals in the, in the revolution who, who, who fancied a more Western-style democracy uh, and not uh, one, a government that's uh, governed by religious law. But he used the fear of the Americans, the Ayatollah Khomeini, to consolidate power to himself and, uh, and label anybody who criticized him you know, uh, basically an American spy. And so this worked very well for him. And so this is some of the propaganda that was put up in downtown Tehran after that revolution, after the seizing of the U.S. Embassy. And so uh, you still see it there. And it's been since that time that the government has encouraged people to chant things like death to America. Um, and although uh, that is still done on occasion, Obviously, most of the people didn't feel that way about Americans in general uh, because I certainly got nothing but uh, um, uh, a friendly welcome from everyone uh, that I met. And yet, some of these are some of the murals that are still there. This is the American embassy, and, or I should say the former American embassy. We have not returned our embassy since they took the, our people hostage. We've never sent an embassy back. And so this is now housed by the Revolutionary Guard. And it was the one place that I was told was a little sensitive and the place probably that I shouldn't go. Uh, and so, of course, it's the first place that I had to go in order to get a picture. Um, but I was kind of discreet. So the American flag would have flown here. This is actually the seal of the United States. And if you get up close, you can see that they've chiseled off uh, it's, it's, so it's difficult to read, but that's basically the American seal on the old former U.S. Embassy. And this is, would have been where uh, the U.S. hostages would have been taken. That basically, the Iranian college students just basically went over the wall and overpowered the, the force that was there. 
And unfortunately, uh, for our government's point of view, is that they went through all of our files, including the CIA files in the embassy, and discovered just how closely the United States was working with the Shah of Iran. So it was really a huge public relations disaster for the United States at the time. Now, the other reason why uh, Americans probably were treated as friendly as they were when I was there this last October is because you've got to remember that the Iranian population is quite quite young, uh, and that the uh, majority of the population is under 30. And so a lot of people don't necessarily remember uh, the Shah and the time period that we're talking about. This is the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, as he was at the time of the revolution. And this is him as a young man. And so he had been an outspoken critic of the, of the Shah's regime even prior uh, to the Second World War. Now, when he was still alive, and he died in 1989, um, he would come out every day. He lived a very, in a very modest home behind this area, and he would come up these stairs, and there would be television cameras placed, and he would address the, the country pretty much on a daily basis uh, from this podium. And he is still, uh, I mean, he's still considered... Uh, you know, a, a hero of the revolution, but obviously a lot of people have been um, disillusioned with the regime that's been put into place since. The Ayatollah that has replaced him as supreme leader, very similar name, it's the Ayatollah Khomeini. This is the Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, but the Ayatollah Khomeini is the current supreme leader, and he is, um, he is not... Uh, he doesn't have the gravitas that this ayatollah had. And there's a lot of ayatollahs, other ayatollahs in Iran today who are not happy uh, with the supreme leader. So we even see in Iran today some dissent within the clerical establishment. So it's not just the students and the common people on the street who are protesting. Um, there is actually much criticism coming against the current regime from amongst the ranks of some of, of the other ayatollahs. And so this, this is, to me the greatest indication that this regime is not going to last very long. I mean, it's my prediction that the current president, Ahmadinejad, will not finish out his term. I mean, he obviously just got reelected to the presidency last year. But, um, and I think that was a real eye-opening experience for many Iranians. I think a lot of Iranians saw themselves as having a democracy. But whatever legitimacy the president had prior to that election was certainly vanquished in that election where um, Ahmadinejad was pronounced the winner so soon when many people didn't even know anybody who voted for him. Um, most of the people rallied around the opposition figure, Mosavi. And he is not, uh, Mosavi is not a, uh, um, a um, you know, he's not a liberal. I mean, he's certainly a fairly conservative individual. And so, uh, you know, we shouldn't be uh, under any false assumptions there. But he has become the rallying cry for those who are not happy, happy with the current regime. Like I said, whatever legitimacy President Ahmadinejad had before that election is gone now. And really, most Iranians are just stunned that, uh, that their, what they thought was a legitimate electoral system has been shown to be uh, one that was completely fixed. This is the tomb of uh, Khomeini. Uh, it's still under construction, even though he died in 1989. Uh, I, was, I found this very underwhelming, actually. It's, it's, I went inside. I saw his grave uh, stone. And it's in a huge warehouse. What, I mean, what looks to me like a warehouse. I mean, it looked like an empty Walmart. Uh, and in the middle was this, this gravestone. I mean, not what I would consider... Uh, the due for somebody who was so revered in, in recent Iranian history. And then outside, this is what it appears to be, and there's going to be, uh, it's going to be a shopping mall, it's going to be hotels, uh, it's going to be uh, markets, which I think is, is a, a pretty kitschy thing to do for somebody who um, is a revered figure. But this is, this is the plan. And, and like so many things in Iran, it's, it's not, the construction is not finished. Uh, I found this to be the case for a lot of the larger mosques in Iran. And another thing that I was surprised about is that Iranians don't 
they don't go to, um, they aren't going to the mosque on Friday like they used to. You know, after the revolution in 1979, everybody went to the mosque. The mosques were full because the, you know, Islam, the clerical establishment, played such a prominent role in helping to overthrow the Shah. Well, since that time, there's been delusionment setting in, and uh, people are not going to the mosque anymore. You go to, I, I was told by my God, you go to the mosque and there, there are, um, there's a lot of space, there's a lot of room at the mosque, they're not crowded like they used to be. And yet in the 1980s, the government thought that that popularity of going to Friday mosque was going to continue and they made all of these construction plans for these huge mosques. Many of them have never been completed. And there was some, there was some speculation that the government was embarrassed to complete them uh, because there have become this huge white elephants. And if they did complete them and nobody actually showed up, it would be even that much more embarrassing. So there seems to be some speculation on why they haven't completed a lot of this construction. Of course, you've got to remember that uh, Iran has a lot of trouble getting international financing for a lot of its uh, infrastructure improvement. Um, I, for example, couldn't use a MasterCard or Visa uh, just about anywhere in Iran um, because the U.S. sanctions abroad have basically shut down access to that international capital. Uh, there were a few shops who dealt primarily maybe in Persian rugs who had bank access in Spain that could somehow use uh, a MasterCard or Visa. But for the most part, you couldn't use Visa or MasterCard um, anywhere. And it was really difficult to find a lot of uh, what we typically see as American products. I didn't see a lot. I did see Coke and Pepsi, and I did see American cigarettes, uh, but that was about it. I didn't see the typical things that you would see everywhere else in the world where, uh, of American products. These are, uh, this is just outside of Tehran University, and this is a heavy police presence. Now, there was no protest the day I was there, and I was told that if I did see a protest, it would be something to avoid, because like we've seen on television, it could turn violent. So I was wary of that, but I did want to go to Tehran University uh, to see what I could see. And what I did find is not a protest, but I did see a heavy police presence. The men in green, you see all of the squad cars, just offside. The, the university is just on the other side of the street. And they were prepared for uh, any spontaneous protests that might occur that day. And as you've seen on the news, the crackdowns have been pretty severe. I show you this map because I wanted to point out that in Iran, it's not the uh, monolithic, uh, uh, you know, single culture that, we're, that we maybe assume. You know, predominantly there's Persians that live there. They speak Persian, not Arab. But there are Arabs that live in Iran, as well as other minorities. And you see in this chart that a lot of the Arab population would live down here, and they would speak Arabic. Uh, and many of them, of course, would be Muslim as well. But it's, a, it's a, an important distinction to be made between the Persians and the Arabs who have fought each other throughout history, not just in the 1980s, as I outlined before. And then over here you have the Baluchis. Uh, you have the Azeris living up here. And I should point out that there are more Azeris living in Iran than there are in Azerbaijan, which is an independent state. And there's Kurds as well. There's actually more Kurds in Iran than there are in Iraq. And we hear so often about the Kurds in Iraq. And they are, uh, they are suspect populations. The government is, is very uh, aware of the separatism that's taking place in Iraq. The last thing they want to see is a, is a Kurdistan, uh, an independent uh, state for the Kurds that might draw uh, land claims on the Kurdish areas of Iran. They don't want to see their own population break away. They don't want to lose any more territory than they've lost in the 20th century. And not only are there different ethnic populations in Iran, and I, uh, by the way, the, uh, the Persian population, the Persian-speaking population is just over 50 percent. So uh, there is a lot of minorities in Iran. And not just ethnic minorities, but also religious minorities. This is a Zoroastrian temple. I don't know if you're familiar with the Zoroastrian faith, but it's quite ancient. Uh, it, it, it was the faith of Iran before Islam came, before Muhammad. And uh, when the Arabs came and conquered Iran back in the 7th century, 
uh, they brought Islam. But prior to that, most Iranians were Zoroastrian, uh, followers of the prophet Zoroaster, and it's really kind of debatable when he actually lived, but definitely we're talking anywhere from 1,000 to 500 years B.C. And uh, it's, it, it's considered to be one of the first uh, monotheistic faiths, and certainly Christianity and other, some of the mono, monotheistic religions have borrowed from it. For example, in Christianity, uh, a lot of symbolism for Zoroastrianism is borrowed, the whole idea of light representing good and uh, dark representing evil, uh, the light against the dark. Uh, fire is a very sacred symbol in Zoroastrianism. Um, and this shows you how ancient it is. This same symbol right here on this modern Zoroastrian temple, this fire temple, this is, a, this symbols, this is in Persopolis. This, is where I, this was in the ruins of the Persian Empire that I was looking at, 500 B.C. And so you can see, still see the same symbol there. So it shows you how old this Zoroastrian faith goes back there. This is a fire, the sacred fire, the eternal flame inside one of the Zoroastrian temples. And this is, the, uh, this is a tower of silence. This would have been a Zoroastrian custom as well because the Zoroastrians didn't believe in uh, burying their dead uh, because death is defiling and death would defile the, the earth. And they don't believe in burning their dead like uh, uh, in cremation uh, because then that defiles the air. So the Zoroastrians would put their dead up inside these towers of silence and then the vultures would come and clean the, uh, the bodies uh, clean um, from the bone. Now, the Shah of Iran, the last Shah, shut this tower down in the 1970s because he considered it to be unhygienic. And so he forced the Zoroastrians to find an alternative. They still do this, by the way, in, in India. But in Iran now, the Zoroastrians uh, have created these concrete chambers in the ground where they put their dead bodies in it so that, they, that the, the defiling death will not leach out into the earth. So they still protect the earth from defilement, but they've had to uh, accommodate their practice to, to do that. Well, all right, let's hope that stops. Uh, this is a, a modern-day Zoroastrian. You can see that he, he's proudly wearing the symbol of his faith on his chest. And he's actually one of the tour guides that we ran into. This is a synagogue in, uh, in Esfahan in Iran. And so we had a few Jews in our, in our group. And, uh, and so we wanted to visit a synagogue while we were there. And uh, we were very surprised that we didn't have to go through any metal, metal detector to get inside. We just walked right in. Um, and even the, the American Jews who were in our group were astounded by that. Because, and I can agree. Because when I was in Istanbul, Turkey, we went to a synagogue. And it was going through like airport security to get inside the synagogue. I mean, because they had experienced bombings uh, at that synagogue. And uh, apparently none of that in Iran. There was no, there was no need. Uh, there was no need for that type of security. We just basically just walked in. And even the... Uh, even the uh, Jews that I saw in the marketplace, I saw Muslims visiting uh, uh, Jewish shops, uh, shopping there. The Jews were wearing their yarmulkes. They were not hiding the fact that they were Jews in the marketplace. And there, no, there didn't seem to be any fear amongst the Jewish population by their fellow uh, uh, Muslim neighbors. Now, I'm not going to tell you that they're not discriminated against. Um, you know, Jews all over the world face discrimination. But I think there's a, a distinct distinction to be made between discrimination and persecution. I mean, it's one thing to be uh, discriminated against uh, and treated uh, not as an equal, but it's another thing to be actively persecuted and fear for your life. And what I'm telling you is that in Iran, I did not see any evidence of Jews fearing for their lives. The people I did see, I didn't actually see, but the people I know who feared for their lives were not the Jews. They actually were the uh, Baha'is. Uh, you know, we have, we have Baha'is even here in, in Michigan. And it was a faith that really began um, out of Iran. They, they, it began in the 19th century when a new prophet was declared. And it's, it's most offensive to Muslims because Muhammad was, is to be the last prophet uh, that God sent. And for 
for anyone like the Baha'is to claim that there was a, a new prophet in the 19th century is just reprehensible to Muslims. And so um, the Baha'i faith is persecuted in Iran, and Baha'is do have to fear for their lives. They do have to fear imprisonment. But that's not something that Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, or any of the other religious minorities had to in Iran. Now, I found that, uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me, well, then how is it that uh, President Ahmadinejad uh, has certainly said inflammatory things about Israel, talks of wiping it off the map? Where is the animosity uh, against Israel? Certainly, if Ahmadinejad was out to exterminate Israel and all Jews, he could start with his own Jews in Iran, which he obviously hasn't. So it's, it's not... Um, it's not the faith, really. It's so much as the, the, the displacement of Muslim Palestinians by what they consider to be European Jews invading this area in the early 20th century, which, is, uh, which they consider basically a European invasion akin to the Crusades a thousand years ago. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of the resentment against Israel is because of Israeli policies. It's because of how Israel was created. Uh, it's not... Uh, it's not just a resentment against, against Jews, although I'm not going to tell you that you don't find that everywhere. Um, but certainly the Persian Jews that I saw were not living in fear of their lives like they do in Turkey. When I was, even, the, even some of the, the uh, Jews in our group said that when they went to Germany, they had to go through uh, 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 metal detectors just to get in the synagogues in Germany. And we didn't have to do that in Iran. And so this was a, a Jew who's doing his prayer. I saw um, Jews in the marketplace with wearing their yarmulkes in full view, full view of every, everybody else, Muslims shopping at their stores. Um, not what I would have anticipated. Also, uh, Christianity is also present in um, Iran. Christianity has a long history in Iran. Obviously, uh, Christianity was uh, very prevalent even before Islam came. And the the uh, the church that uh, the Christian tradition that uh, became known as the Persian Church uh, followed the Nestorian branch of Christianity. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Nestorians. It's actually quite rare to find a Nestorian uh, Christian today. But um, in early Christianity, there was there was this dispute over how human Jesus was. Uh, there were those who believed that Jesus they wanted they emphasized Jesus' humanity. And they believed, like the Nestorians, that uh, Jesus was fully human. Uh, he was not, uh, God essentially possessed a human child after it was born. And that became Jesus Christ. Uh, so in other words, Jesus was born just a man and then was possessed by God after birth. That's the, the Nestorian tradition. Well, the Egyptian uh, school of Christianity found that offensive and said that, no, they needed to emphasize they wanted to emphasize Jesus' uh, divinity. And although they recognized that Jesus was partly human, he wasn't human like you or I, in that whatever humanity he had was easily consumed by his divinity. And so there was this, this dispute in early Christianity between this Egyptian school of thought and this Persian school of thought. And then, of course, you had the European tradition come in and say, you're both wrong. Uh, or you're both partly right, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you know, the, the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, they looked at it and said that, uh, that both Jesus was both wholly human and wholly divine, and that, uh, uh, and that this paradox existed simultaneously. This is the European tradition that is most common throughout the world uh, in Christian areas. Um, you know, so... Uh, it, you know, we, we, we forget that there was these other traditions. And in the Nestorian tradition, uh, it still exists. And this is a Nestorian church. This is the Assyrian church. And Assyrian is also an ethnic minority in Iran. They speak Aramaic, which is another Semitic language. Uh, but they embrace the Nestorian tradition. And this tradition at one time was very prevalent throughout Asia. The, the Nestorian Christians went on to convert most of Asia to Christianity. And they were only uh, essentially exterminated by the Mongols uh, much later. And so there's, it's very rare to come across them, and so I was happy to see a Nestorian church, uh, and I took a picture of it. This is an Armenian Christian church, and the Armenians follow the Egyptian tradition. Um, 
you know, the Armenians, the Syrians, and the, uh, the Coptics uh, of Egypt, uh, like I said, emphasize the divinity of Jesus and, 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 and reject the, uh, the idea that, he was, that his humanity was somehow distinct in any way. Same church, just different view. This is an Armenian Christian, and, and uh, besides being an Armenian Christian, they, uh, pr- practicing that version of Christianity, he, he obviously speaks Armenian. So this is another minority uh, ethnic group in Iran. And the Iranian parliament, to this day, still reserves seats for Christians, Zoroastrians, and Jews, are guaranteed seats in the Iranian parliament even today. Now granted, they're small, in number and maybe politically insignificant, but they are guaranteed seats and they are accepted. The Baha'is, not. And of course the dominant faith of Iran is Islam and like I said that came in the seventh century when the Arabs conquered it, but in many ways culturally they were conquered by the Persians because Persian architecture figures um, uh, hugely throughout the, the Arab world. And so um, you've got this Persian Iwan and um, uh, a lot of the, the Persian domes. And the architecture is really quite stunning. And these, this kind of honeycomb formation in the mirab. They're, they're not, in Islam, they're not allowed to, uh, to depict human or animal images. And so they, they concentrate on geographic or geometric forms. These are some of the clerics that we met while we were there. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, you know in Islam, there's, just as there's the divisions in Christianity that I talked about, in Islam there's also divisions. Um, the, the ones we hear most about is the difference between the Sunnis and, and the Shiites. Does anybody know the difference between the two? Yes? That's right. That's exactly right. And uh, after Muhammad was killed by another, um, what became another minority, they, um, they started their own branch of Islam, essentially. And the Sunni are the ones who would say that there should be no succession, that the, those who are taught should be the leaders, the religious leaders. Yeah, that's essentially correct. The, the difference is over who they grant the authority to for the faith. Um, just like uh, between the, the, the Catholics and the Greek Orthodox, the early division in the Christianity was also over who should be the proper authority for the faith. And uh, um, there were those who felt that the Bishop of Rome should be the leader of the faith. And there was others who said, no, the Bishop of New Rome, Constantinople, should be the, the, the authority for the faith. Those who embraced or pledged allegiance to the Bishop of Constantinople became, uh, the, the, he, the Bishop of Constantinople became the patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church, and then uh, the Bishop of Rome became the Pope. And so that division is similar between Sunni and Shiites, it's that uh, in, the Shiites believed that the authority for the faith after Muhammad died should be a blood descendant of Muhammad. And so it's only his, his bloodline that really should be the authority for the faith. Now, he, Muhammad didn't have any male children. He had a daughter by the name of Fatima who married his, his cousin, Ali, and they had a child, Hussein, as in Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, you know, so that, that Hussein figure is very important in Islam. And so the, uh, this is the line that um, Shiites believe is important, and, and these should be the leader of the faith, what the Shiites call the imam. The Sunnis rejected that. The Sunnis said it didn't have to be a blood descendant. Um, they felt that it could, you know, as long as it was a, chosen amongst the elders of the Muhammad's tribe, which is the Quraysh tribe, then that was sufficient. And so it didn't need to be a blood descendant at all. Now, the Sunnis and the Shiites fought that out early on. They both recognized Ali as a leader. But Ali was murdered by uh, uh, the Sunnis, and so was Hussein, and so was Ali's descendants. Uh, and so the Shiite tradition, they lost the titanic struggle between the two, and which is why the Shiites are the minority sect in Islam today. 
I think only like 10% of Muslims throughout the world are Shiites. Uh, 90% are Sunnis. And it also explains why there's resentment against Sunnis and Shiites. Because the Shiites, their leaderships, or their, their saints, if you will, for lack of a better term, were all murdered by the Sunnis. And, uh, and they died horrible deaths. Um, and so th that resentment still lingers. And, the, and the, the Shiites still commemorate the deaths of their fallen heroes, especially Hussein. The, the murder of Hussein, is, uh, the grandson of Muhammad, is, uh, uh, at the hands of a Sunni was notorious in Shiite Islam. Now, most Iranians are Shiites. So of, you know, of all the world's Muslims, I said Shiites are minority, and yet in Iran it's just the opposite. In Iran, the Sunnis are the minority. And there's not many countries that are like that. Iran is one, uh, where Shiites are the majority. Um, Iraq is another. And uh, Bahrain. And I think that's pretty much it. You also find some Shiites in Lebanon, uh, even in Saudi Arabia. But they're, wherever else they're found, they're a minority. There's really very few countries that Shiites are in the majority. Iran is by far the largest one. And so... Um, and so you, here you have these clerics. What's interesting, though, is that uh, the Sunnis, what they call the caliph, the successor of the prophet, uh, he went on to rule the, the, the great Arab, Arab empire and so on. And the last person who really had that title was the, the sultan of the Ottoman Turkish empire. And when the, Otto, the last Ottoman Turkish sultan was um, deposed, so was the last caliph. So the irony today is that there is no one figure that's the authority for the faith in either camp. You know, the imams of, of the Shiites, they were all murdered. There was 12 of them, by the way. And the last imam, the 12th imam, is uh, considered to, uh, to be uh, in hiding. And this is, uh, we're talking a 1,000 years ago. So uh, he's been hiding a long time, uh, but he will return. Right? So the Shiites are waiting for this uh, Messiah-like figure their 12th imam, who didn't die, unlike the others, and he will return. So there is no, there is no leader for the Shiite faith today. The last uh, Sunni caliph uh, that the Turks claimed was over deposed. I'm not sure that many of the Arabs necessarily thought he was a legitimate, but the fact is there's nobody with the title of caliph today, which is the Arab word for successor. So there's no, uh, there's no caliph in Sunni Islam, there's no imam in uh, Shiite Islam, uh, the irony is there is, is no li one leader of the faith in either sect, but the, the divisions between those sects is still there. The Sunnis, by the way, are not waiting for anybody to return. They think the idea of this 12th Imam coming back is just nonsense. More than that, they think it's a, it's, it's a heresy, you know, which is why many Sunnis uh, despise Shiites as apostates. Like uh, Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, he is a Sunni. And uh, he has, uh, not only has he killed other infidels like Christians and Jews, but he has also killed what he considered to be the, the Shiite infidels. And which is one reason why the Taliban government of Afghanistan, which was also Sunni, was not in good relations with the Shiite government of Iran. They hated the Taliban. The Taliban in Afghanistan were murdering Shiites, Shiites that uh, many Iranians have uh, an affinity for. So it was another reason why they did, they did not miss the overthrow of the Taliban regime, and we're glad to see the U.S. get rid of them. They just don't want to see the U.S. stick around. These clerics are specifically wearing a black turban, and the black turban is significant. Any Shiite cleric who wears a black turban is showing that they are a blood descendant of Muhammad. And I've already explained the importance of that. So even though this is not the hidden imam, uh, they are blood descendants of Muhammad, which gives them uh, gravitas within the Shiite sect. This shows you uh, a slide commemorating, it's kind of a diorama showing you the murder of Hussein at the hands of the Sunnis. And it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it looks like something maybe some high school students put together, but if you look rather closely, it's rather gruesome. And, and the... Uh, there, his arm is off. There's blood spurting here. He's, uh, there's one holding a child uh, um, uh, who's got a big arrow sticking in him. And um, the Shiites commemorate the death of Hussein and his line. Um, and the anniversary is, is commemorated with uh, uh, 
uh, ritual uh, self-flagellation. And uh, they kind of conduct like a passion play, like the, the Roman Catholics uh, did, basically commemorating the, uh, the brutal murder of, of their most revered figure at the hands of the Sunni. And to, to, uh, to feel the pain, of course, uh, to some level, they carry around this uh, 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 big wooden frame, and they get everybody who can get under it, carry it. And so they kind of like bear their cross for their slain uh, Hussein. And this is a Hosania where that's actually done. You can see how large it is in scale. And it just it weighs a ton. And they will carry that around. The other things that the Shiites do is that they have this... Uh, um, uh, they believe in um, that these imams can intercede on their behalf uh, with God. And, um, and they have these little, um, these little stones that are supposedly made from the earth of... Um, that contain some of the deceased imams. And they will put this on the ground uh, so that their forehead doesn't touch the ground directly, but instead t- touches these stones. Sunnis consider this, again, uh, heresy. And uh, when they do the, 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 uh, the Hajj in Mecca, uh, there are, on occasions, if the Sunnis catch the Shiites doing this, putting this on, uh, between their forehead and the ground, they will beat them. Uh, and so this, this resentment uh, is real between the two sects. Then there's the Sufis. I don't know if you're familiar with the Sufis. The Sufis are the mystics in Islam. Um, If you're familiar with mysticism, it's an attempt to experience God uh, physically. In other words, it's not enough to believe in Him. It's not enough to uh, uh, rationally accept Him. Uh, But they want to feel God directly. Now, we have mystics in in Christianity. There's also mystics in Judaism who practice Kabbalah. and some of the Hasidic Jews, they'll do, you know, they'll physically work themselves into a static state, uh, doing somersaults and dances. Uh, some of the Sufis in Islam will do uh, their whirling dervishes. Are were Sufis? They'll, they'll, I've seen whirling dervishes just turn in place for 40 minutes at a time and just walk away like they they weren't dizzy at all. Um, you know, they put themselves in kind of a, a, a trance. You know, in Christianity, we have a lot of Pentecostals who will. Um, uh, speak in tongues, right? They kind of go into a trance and start speaking different languages. Uh, this is an ex- attempt to experience God in a physical way. There's Catholic mystics in the Philippines who will actually, uh, every Easter, they will actually nail themselves to crosses. They'll put the nails, hammer the nails right through their hands because it's not enough to believe that God died for our sins. They have to experience it. And so the Sufis uh, do just that. They are the, the mystics of Islam and they... they uh, will either sing and go into ecstatic trances, uh, um, uh, chanting mantras and that sort of thing. Many Sunnis and Shiites, uh, you, can be a Sunni Suf, you can be a Sufi in the Sunni tradition. Most Sufis are in the Sunni tradition. But there are a few Sufi sects that are in the Shiite tradition. Either way, uh, Orthodox Sunni and Orthodox Shiite kind of look down at them as uh, fringe groups. And, and they're, not, uh, they're not necessarily treated well. In Iran, but here's this. This man is a Sufi. This is uh, some of the um, uh, of the Afghan refugees that have come across the border, and, and uh, Iran has certainly experienced an influx since the the U.S. war that's being waged there, and um, and unfortunately they're not treated well. These actually, this is a school day, and these kids were not in school; uh, they're just on the street. I guess I really uh, have gone over my promised time, but I did allow uh, some time for questions. So is there any questions that you have that I can address? And I, I understand if people do have to leave because I, uh, I wanted to only talk for an hour and then resort uh, to Q&A. But is there, is there any questions or would you just like me to few, show a few more slides? It's, it's your preference. And if you have to leave, I certainly understand. Yes. Yeah, they're actually a majority. Um, a majority of university students are now women. So uh, they, they do, and, they, and the, the government universities are co-ed. So they will study together with men. 
some of the private universities uh, uh, segregate, but um, the government universities are co-ed. Is there a lot of censorship over the material that's taught? Well, I'm sure. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, a democracy that embraces free speech like we do. Um, so, yes, the Sharia law is the law, and you're not allowed to... Uh, um, you don't have complete freedom of speech in Iran. And so, yeah, I'm sure the universities are quite structured that way. But, you know, but I found people very free to talk on the street. You know, it's not like they, uh, you know, if they weren't around the Revolutionary Guard, you know, they felt pretty open to share their thoughts. Like I said, I, I couldn't tell you how many people were just so apologetic about their government and, what, and what's being done. I asked a lot of them about, um, about Ahmadinejad in particular. Uh, for example, you know, what they, did they think that uh, Iran should have nuclear weapons, for example? Uh, many of them did not consider nuclear weapons a priority for them. Uh, and, and maybe they thought the government was maybe making, you know, trouble that wasn't necessary. But they, they still claimed the right to have them if they wanted them. In other words, their response to me was essentially, who are you to tell us? that we can't have nuclear weapons. You know, was nuclear weapons a priority for most people? No. But did they think that the, the choice should be theirs? Yeah, they did. They didn't understand. They didn't like the idea that the United States could just dictate who had nuclear weapons and who couldn't. Um, certainly, the United States is concerned about it. Israel is concerned about it. Um, Certainly, President Ahmadinejad has said some inflammatory things about Israel. But like I said, if he was really out to exterminate all Jews, he could start with his own population, which he hasn't. Uh, I think a lot of the issue he has is, is with the Israeli government and, and its presence in what he considers a, a land grab uh, by European Jews. So what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that you know, democracy may be on the horizon for Iran. I mean, I saw enough examples of it. I think, I think they're probably more ready for democracy than many other places in the Middle East. And so maybe it'll happen. But if Iran does become a democracy, I don't necessarily think they're going to give up plans to have nuclear weapons. I mean, after all, we're a democracy, and we insist on having them. So, and if they do become a democracy, I don't think they're going to be friends with Israel. I mean, they're still going to be Muslim. They're still going to identify with the Muslim Palestinians over the Jewish Israelis. So, even if uh, the United States policy has its optimum outcome and we end up having the, the regime in Iran overthrown, Iran becomes a, f uh, a flourishing democracy, they're still always going to have trouble with Iran. I still think they're going to want to have nuclear weapons. I just don't see that changing. Well, we do consider, I think Turkey is a democracy, yeah. Um, and it is, it is predominantly a Muslim country. Um, it's probably the best example of a Muslim democracy. Oh, oh, here's another one. Here's the largest Muslim country on the planet, Indonesia. That's a democracy. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not like there aren't examples out there. But uh, obviously there's some lacking in, in many of the Arab countries in the Middle East. Um, but partly that's our own doing too. I mean, we we defend uh, Saudi Arabia to the hilt, and that's you you can't get a more autocratic monarchy than that. It's Bob. Well, like I said, I don't think, I think the, the answer would vary depending on who you asked. It's not like there's just this, I mean, we, I think we, we have the assumption that there's just this group of liberals that are really behind all of these protests. And what I'm telling you is, obviously there are some liberals in Iran who would embrace a more American-style liberal democracy. But they're not all the protesters are liberals. A lot of the protesters are also conservatives. Some of them are devout Muslims. They just... There is many different people in Iran who have a trouble with the current regime. Uh, for one thing, they don't like Ahmadinejad's uh, economic policy, and, and, and Iran's isolation has also hobbled uh, Iran's economy. I mean, I already mentioned that it's, they have trouble getting international finance. 
They have to import gasoline in a country that is awash in oil. They, they don't have the refining capacity. They have to export the oil and import the refined gasoline because they don't have a, enough refining capacity and they don't have the, the capital to upgrade. Um, our bus in the, western, the eastern part of the country, we had, we had to go to several gas stations before we found one that had gasoline because they were dry. Because what the, the current government is doing is they're subsidizing uh, gasoline. It's only 12 cents a liter, which is nothing. And so what people are doing is they're buying gasoline at 12 cents a liter and hoarding it, and then they're taking it across the border into Pakistan and selling it at market prices. So you can imagine if you, you could see Americans doing that. If, if you could buy gasoline in Michigan for 12 cents a liter and then take it across the border in Indiana or Canada and sell it at market rates, uh, many people, well, we know we do that because we've seen them do that with uh, our cans, right, on the deposits, um, our soda cans. You know, it's a, you're not supposed to take it in Indiana and uh, profit the, the difference, but people do. They're, that's what they're doing in Iran. And so much so that we, we had trouble even finding gasoline in the eastern part of the state. So the economy is very state-controlled, uh, which has certainly reduced its productivity. And, uh, and so that's part of the problem. The unemployment rate is um, about 12% officially, but the, un uh, the unofficial unemployment rate would be higher. Uh, inflation is about, I think, 16% right now. Um, the economy is... Uh, grew last year maybe uh, by GDP 2%. So it's, it's, it's pretty stagnant. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not the economic growth that, they, that many would aspire to. And so there's a lot of lingering resentment for the situation. You know, just like we blame, blame our government for the economy, whether it's justified or not, so do they. So that's part of it. And then, of course, you've got this differences of opinion even within the clerical establishment. Like I said, there's a lot of ayatollahs who not, are not exactly happy with the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. So in answer to your question, it very much depends on who you ask as far as what types of government you'd like to see. I didn't get the impression that they were all ready to change their constitution, but I think they would like to see the current government follow their constitution, you know, uh, that there be more limits on what the supreme leader does and that there be uh, more power vested in the parliament, which is the Majli. They have an elected parliament. It's just that the supreme leader keeps overruling anything that they attempted to do, at least uh, uh, several years ago when it was a more liberal uh, parliament. Yes? In one of your earlier slides, you noted uh, uh, the housing uh, sort of got further away from, from the town and more into the hills and more of the wealthy people. Right, and the, the higher elevations, because uh, uh, Tehran is built like on the, the, the slope of a mountain. Yeah, I saw more conservative dress in the rural areas and the poor areas, yeah. I definitely saw that. And I was told as much uh, in some of the more affluent areas of Iran, uh, there's some great parties. Yeah, some private homes, alcohol, the whole bit. That, uh, that uh, those who have the means, uh, they do pretty well. And their, uh, their access to... Uh, to things maybe uh, you know that we would appreciate that uh, is illegal or banned um, is uh, is very prevalent. I, I, I might as well say that Iran has a huge drug problem. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, the heroin that's produced uh, in from Afghanistan comes over the border, and so there are uh, quite a few addicts in Iran. So the, the the drug trade from Afghanistan is something that they they're having trouble getting a handle on even. Even this last year, there were uh, several high-ranking uh, members of the Revolutionary Guard that were uh, supposedly attacked by drug dealers and, and murdered. And these would be these would be the Afghan refugees. This is uh, some of the, the car. This is a car that they produce in Iran. It's called the Saman. So they have their own auto line, and then they <laughs> the motor motorcycle canopy, which I thought was kind of unique. 
and the cigarette packs. I thought, this, here they have a, American cigarettes, but uh, the warning quite clear uh, on what it can do to you, even though I can't read um, Persian. And this was, uh, this was inside the Azadi Tower. This was their kind of their <laughs> version of Epcot Center, I guess. They were trying to impress people with their, their, uh, their technology. And the, the tour guide told me to walk up to it and ask it any question I wanted to. And, of course, I did. And uh, <laughs> I asked her anything about the Azadi Tower. And, uh, it, of course, it knew all kinds of facts. But what it was is the tour guide was just speaking into a microphone. <laughs> over, over, and this robot was, you know, talking. They, they just thought that was kind of impressive, and I thought it was uh, funny. Uh, this were, these are pomegranates. They, there are a lot of pomegranates uh, groves in Iran. Um, plastic surgery, very popular in Iran. Um, they're, they're, they're very intent on having a more uh, pug nose because um, they've got, you know, they've got a, uh, a larger nose that I don't find necessarily unattractive, but apparently uh, it's not the nose many Iranians aspire to. So even the men, and, it, and there's, they show no vanity. I mean, they're, just, they're almost proud of the fact that they've had plastic surgery and they want you to know about it uh, because it shows that they've, they've got some means. And uh, this woman, I think, has had a, one, a nose job that I don't necessarily approve of. But, uh, <laughs> but it, you, see that you see this a lot. And uh, sex change operations are also uh, paid for by the government in Iran, even though homosexuality is forbidden and, and it's a death sentence. Um, but uh, so on one hand, <laughs> very restrictive, and yet when it comes to sex change operations, very progressive. This is some of the. This was a chicken with pomegranate sauce. It was a typical meal that I had. This is more some of the more conservative dress that you're talking about, Steve, in the rural areas, uh, of people of more modest means. Is there any, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, don't you see that here on campus? Well, yeah, the older the woman. The more modest they dress, yeah, I've noticed that. Too. Yes, Bob. You mentioned earlier that the vast majority of Trump presidents are Muslim, and the majority of all Muslims are Trump presidents, and most of America too. But you know, the, the younger people don't look at Trump as someone who said, "Well, the Shah's you know uh, oppression." And, you know, they That's true. Know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, Bob, because I had that baffled me. Because their their love for America was surreal. I mean, it was almost like they loved the idea of America without really having an idea of what America really was. I mean, it really it didn't get the sense that their their assumptions of America were realistic in any way. I mean, cuz nobody loves Americans that much. I mean, I don't not even in Western Europe do I get that kind of reception. It was crazy. You know, I, you know I, I don't even know if I love Americans that much. You know, uh, we're just not that great. But, <laughs> but they were just, they just had this love affair with the whole idea of America and American culture and everything they, they thought it would be. I'm sure if they, you know, if they had the opportunity to travel, many of them do travel here. I was surprised how many Americans were, uh, had the, uh, of, uh, how many Iranians in America go back and forth. Uh, there's Iranians coming here to see their families in America and ha American Iranians going back there to see their families. So people of means can travel. But I did get the sense that those who hadn't been to America didn't have any realistic conception of what we were really like. I mean, it was just what they'd seen on videos, on the Internet, the music. They like our music. Uh, so, they, you know, it's... Um, you know, I don't know what it was. It was, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I guess. Uh, you know, they, 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 I guess they like, uh, politically, I guess they would have liked the idea of our, our uh, you know, our democratic values, our, uh, our, our, our liberal philosophy when it comes to freedom of speech. You know, President Ahmadinejad tries to make a lot of that, right? You know, you've heard him say, uh, entertain the idea that the Holocaust didn't happen. You know, that, and that Americans would just say, that's ridiculous, right? Well, what he's doing when he says that is he's making political points against Western Europe because in France and Germany today it is a crime it is against the law to say that the Holocaust didn't happen so you can go to prison 
in France and Germany. So what President Ahmadinejad is saying in Iran is he's saying, we've got more freedom of speech than Western Europe. You know, it's, it's his way of really sticking the finger in the eye at the Germans and the French. He can say, you say, you talk about freedom of speech, but in Iran, we really have freedom of speech because we can really have a, a, a debate on whether or not the Holocaust actually happened. And so, you know, he's a shrewd guy. Um, we'll see if he's shrewd enough to stay in power, though. I don't know. I think he's, I think he's overplayed his hand. Uh, the disillusionment is real, and it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, I, the, you know, my tour guide, the people, some of the, granted, I didn't talk to everybody. I talked to a lot of people who spoke English, but even the people who did interpretations, um, you know, nobody seemed to know anybody who voted for Ahmadinejad. I mean, he was, he was just very unpopular. Um, now, I didn't get to talk to the Revolutionary Guard. I'm sure they voted for him. You know, they control a lot of the economy. They're getting a lot of the economic goodies. Um, they have a vested interest in supporting the regime. And, of course, they have uh, a lot of the we weapons. You don't have to worry about Ahmadinejad uh, with regards to nuclear weapons uh, because if they do get nuclear weapons, uh, President Ahmadinejad is not going to control them. It is going to be controlled by the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini. So if, uh, if, if it is a worry, Iran having nuclear weapons, it's Khomeini that we need to watch, not Ahmadinejad. He's not, despite the fact that he's president, he's not the, the, the person who's really running the country. Yes? So is it kind of just like the, I guess, the, kind of like how the Queen of England is, where she's just like a figurehead? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say he's a figurehead. He's got political power. He just doesn't have as much political power as the supreme leader. So is it kind of just like a checks and balances type deal? Like he can make decisions, but he doesn't make decisions? He runs the government, right? So he, has, he, he is, manages the government, but the supreme leader, the religious authority, can basically override anything that he does. So he's got to, he cannot go outside what the supreme leader would want for him. Uh, so the president is, he has political power. He's not, it's not like he's powerless. He's not like the Queen of England, who really has no political power. Uh, he's got political power, but, and, and it'd be interesting to watch if there ends up being a power struggle between the two. Right now, I'd have to say the supreme, supreme leader really by far has, has the authority, and he, President Ahmadinejad has been cowed uh, on several occasions by the supreme le leader, reined in. I was, uh, the, the president, uh, yeah, he, he, it's not, he, he, the Khomeini is not an inherit, it's not an inherited title, if that's what you mean. He's not like a king, he's not a shah, he's not a yeah. king. So if he dies, uh, the clerical establishment known as the Assembly of Religious Experts will pick a new, um, a new Ayatollah to be supreme leader, that's just true. like he, they picked him. But he was actually the, he was actually tagged by the prior Ayatollah Khomeini as his successor. So when Khomeini died, everybody knew that this is the guy that Khomeini wanted to succeed him, and he did. I don't know if this supreme leader has that kind of uh, clout to pull that same trick at his death. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see who actually replaces him. Is he just appointed by like, the majority Muslim clerics? Or is it yeah, the, it's the clerics, that's right. Yeah the clerical uh, establishment. Any other questions? Well, I'm almost out of time, so I thank you all for coming. and. Uh,